Hi, my name is Dave. Hi. Uh, my identity crisis is I'm a Detroit Lions fan. Uh, yeah, thank you for the sympathy. No, I mean, seriously, when you look at these things and this, just this, this little joke here, but this reality of asking the question, who are you? And if you get your identity wrapped in your position or your title, I'm the CEO, I'm the vice president, I'm the, or if you get it wrapped up into something that you do, certain abilities that you have, or if you get t- tied up into relationships, everything that we looked at here in this little drama, in a total goofy way, is something that inside of every one of us can be shaken at our core, because we're not sure if it's going to really be there. And that's what we want to take a look at today. Um, it just, uh, there was a quick story here that, it kind of re- that might set the table for us a little bit. Uh, when I was back in college, I went to Asbury College, which is in Wilmore, Kentucky, Anybody ever been to Wilmore, Kentucky? Yeah. All right. Thanks, Mike. Uh, but in, uh, it was a beautiful place. And one of the things that's beautiful about uh, Kentucky is uh, the rivers that flow. And they have these amazing just cliffs that lots of times we just go out and we would explore. And uh, one day, there were about six of us that went out. And it was a beautiful fall day. Um, the trees had turned color. The leaves were already fallen. Sun was out. And uh, we were up climbing up on these cliffs. And uh, I looked over at one point during our, our, our expedition, and one of my friends was stuck. And she just, she, it was a little bit too steep for her, and she got just frozen, paralyzed by her own fear. And so I thought, man, I better go over and help her. So I, I start coming down the, the, the cliff, and what had happened is the, there are trees as well along. It's a beautiful thing. But the, the leaves had all fallen on, on the cliff. And so as I was coming along, I slipped and it fell on these leaves, and I hit right, fell right on my little tush, and just started taking off down the mountain. And, uh, and it was really kind of fun. You guys ever done that? You're like, woo! You know, you're, just, you know, you're a college student. This is great. And then all of a sudden, I realize, okay, I'm going faster than I want to go, and I'm not sure if I can stop. And uh, I pass my friend as I'm going along, and then I started panicking a little bit. Because I literally, because it was these loose leaves that were kind of wet with a powdery dirt underneath. And I just started taking off. And uh, so finally, I, something clicked inside my head, and I said, man, you better stop, like, now. And so I reached out. There was a tree about this big around, and I reached out, and I grabbed the tree. And as soon as I stopped myself, I hear my friends down at the base where the river was screaming, because I couldn't hear them because of all the leaves and stuff. And, um, and I'm like, what's the big deal? And I, you know, ah, they're all done. And I grabbed the tree. I stopped myself, go over, get my friend. We eventually make it down come all the way to the bottom where the river is, and I look up, and I could see my trail through the leaves where I was falling. And where I stopped, if I had slid 15 feet more, I would have dropped about 50 feet off a cliff. And I had no idea. I'm telling you guys, in that moment right there, just chills just go through your spine because you realize, okay, I was on my way to probably my death or just totally being messed up. And I stopped. I found something to grab onto, and it kept me from falling. Now, I bring that story to you for this reason. In our culture and in our world today, with everything that's going on, and I obviously the economic situation, but there are many other things as well. I know some of you in this room right now feel like you have at least maybe slipped You've had some confidence, things that have been going really well for you, and you've slipped and you've fallen. <laughs> and you're concerned a little bit. Others of you are flying down the mountain, and it's getting out of control. And you wake up every morning, and there's a real sense of insecurity because you do not know what the future holds for your life. And we're falling fast. And there are many people, a guy again came up to me right after the first service, yep, thank you so much for this message, I just lost my job on Wednesday. (laughs) You know, this stuff is happening constantly for us right now. And so my question for us is this, is when, not if, when your world around you starts to fall apart, when it starts to get shaky, when it starts to be something that gets out of control, do you have something to grab onto Do you have something that will help you to be secure and firm in the midst of losing the things around you? I think we need something unshakable when the world around us is shaken. 
Jesus put it this way. In Matthew 7, 24, he tells this, he says this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and he puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You guys remember that song? The wise man built his house upon the rock. Anybody else go to Sunday school? Okay. All right. Just Okay. Uh, so the wise man, he built his house on the rock. The rain came. The streams rose. The winds blew. And they beat against that house. And yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came, the streams rose, the winds blew, and they beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. See, now one of the things that's very interesting about this little story of Jesus is both homes, whether you're built on rock or whether you're built on sand, what's true about both homes? The rains came, the streams rose, the winds beat against both of those homes, and some fell and some didn't. I don't know how you're doing today. I don't know if you're shaking in your boots. I don't know if you have a lot of anxiety about the future, about what's happening in our world, and I don't know what your own personal circumstances are, but I can tell you this. I want to be a person who's going to be able to go through this world where it is going to shake us at some point or another, and I want to be able to stand, and I don't want to fall. Anybody else? Is it possible that no matter what you go through, that you can be unshakable? I think God wants to say to you and me this morning, absolutely, absolutely. And so today, especially with our identity, that's what we want to look at. I don't know if you guys were here because some of us not were here when the first song was sung. Let me read to you some of the words. It says, I don't want to be anything other than what I've been trying to be lately. All I have to do is think of me and I have peace of mind. I'm tired of looking around rooms wondering what I got to do or who I'm supposed to be. I don't want to be anything other than me. I'm surrounded by liars everywhere I turn. I'm surrounded by imposters everywhere I turn. I'm surrounded by an identity crisis everywhere I turn. Am I the only one to notice? And I just, I feel like I want to say, not now, (laughs) not in these days. I think every single one of us, if it's not happening to you, it's happening to someone that you know. Their world is being shaken, and when your world gets shaken, then all of a sudden, your identity has a chance to get shaken. And I just want to encourage you today that God so wants to bring us to a completely different place. So can we pray? Let's just pray together real quick. And um, would you just do this uh, again? I always try to say this because I know that when, you, when I'm out there listening to somebody else and they pray, I just kind of sit there and get through this part of the deal. Could you actually pray while I do this and ask God, maybe he has something he wants to share with you today to help secure you and to make you unshakable in the midst of this world? I hope he does. Let's pray. God, that's why we're here. We are here every week because we believe that you are everything that we need. And and Jesus, right now, in the world that we live in and the stuff that's going on around us, we need a rock We need something to stand on. We need something that's going to help us not to fall. We need something to grab onto that can hold us firm no matter what goes on around us. And God, one of the greatest things to me this morning is to know that you know every person in this room. You know the circumstance that they're going through. You know those who are shaken in their boots. You know those who are doing fine. And maybe are those that you want to use as those to strengthen others. But God, you just, you know our hearts. And my prayer right now in the name of Jesus Christ is that you might just surprise us again this morning and say something to us that deeply ministers to our heart and to our soul. And I pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys. So when you get asked, who are you? How how do you answer? See, we answer that question in so many ways. We'll answer by, you know, sometimes even just by how we physically are. Well, I'm tall, dark, and handsome, and I'm blonde and flabby. Um, But uh, 
we will answer stuff like that. We'll answer with what we do. Well, this is what my job is. These are my, these are my abilities, my accomplishments. Or what positions you hold. Well, I'm a parent or I'm a spouse. I'm a husband. I'm a wife. I'm single. I'm a CEO. I'm a vice president. I'm a, we say all of these certain things. But at the core, who are you? Really? And one of the things I just want to remind you of very quickly is that at the core, inside of every one of your cells, the DA, the DNA, genetic code that you have within you is unbelievable, specifically designed so that you can look around this room right here. You can look around the whole world, which is just unbelievable to me. And you are not going to find one person who's you. There's nobody else out there who's you. I mean, you might find somebody who looks similar. You ever done that? You ever seen in a magazine and seen somebody who looked like you? Anybody ever have that happen? Yeah? Okay, okay, one? Uh, okay, that was a bad example. Um, but anyway, as you go around, I mean, you might even find somebody who looks like you. Sometimes you go, oh, there's my soul brother or sister because they, they think like you. But you know at the very core inside every single one of your cells is a DNA that nobody else has that has made you who you are. And one of the things we have to remember, and I know in our world, in our education system, and with, there's just this huge argument, whether it's creation or whether we're all just by a chance. Again, if you're here, you probably know that we believe in creationism. We believe that God has specifically designed us and created us exactly how he wanted you to be, that you are his idea, that you exist for this reason. And when I stop and I think about that, I'm like, man, God, this is, it's unbelievable that I just even exist because of you. And that you made me who I am. I had no choice in this. But this is who you made me to be. And you and I need to remember that our value to God is so incredibly high because you were created by him. And you are amazingly valuable to him. But one of the things that happens is, in our world, is that's never enough. For some reason, knowing or even believing that I'm created by God and that I'm unique to him, that he has a plan and a purpose for me, doesn't seem to be enough for me. And I think what's happening in our world is there's this kind of identity theft that goes on. We should believe that we're really valuable to God, but for some reason, we don't. Anybody out there ever experienced identity theft? Has anybody had to go through that? Okay, two or three or four. Do I hear five? There's five. Thank you. Six. Seven in the back. Great. Okay. Anyway. Uh, I never have in, in the sense where somebody's tried to steal my, steal my social security number or you know, my uh, uh, credit card or anything of that nature. But right after 9-11, do you guys remember 9-11? Hey, you want to talk about being shaken? I mean, our country was shaken on that day. And I remember, I, I believe it was three, two or three months after that happened, Susie and I made our first trip to come out here to Salt Lake City to check it out. And so I go up to the counter and I hand them my driver's license, right? Because they want to know who I am. <laughs> so I go, I'm David Michael Nelson. Here you go. I hand her my card. As soon as I give her my driver's license, she goes like this. And she gets her eyes really big and she looks at her screen. Uh, and she goes, um, I'll, I'll be right back, Mr. Nelson. And she, you know, she does this really quick walk in the back and I'm standing there. And literally, I stood there for like 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden, this guy in a suit walks out nice and calmly. Hello, Mr. Nelson. Yes, we just have a few things we need to look at with your, you know, and this is 9-11. You guys remember this? I'm in an airport after 9-11. And sure enough, while he's talking to me, two police officers come and grab me by the arm and pull me away. Now, I'm freaking out because, you know, you just don't know what the, the country's all freaking out. Everybody's on alarm and who's this person? And these cops take me aside and I stand with them for about a half hour while they check out to see if I am who I say I am. And finally, they say yes. All right? You are who you say you are. I'm like, thank you very much. <laughs> I knew that already. And, and so they let me fly. So the next day, I got on the phone. I called the FBI. And I said, hey, I had a really funky experience go on. Could you tell me what, what's up? And they just, and the gal looked at some things. She gets back on the phone. She says, well, I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is you're not him. And I said, well, great. Who's him? Well, the bad news is there's a guy with your name who's on the FBI watch list. And until they find him, you're going to have to go through this every time. 
And it's just so bizarre, you guys. So for like years, in fact, it was on the like nightline one night. Dave Nelson's having trouble flying. I'm like, I know, I know. It was just, it was just crazy. And here's what's weird is I'm saying I'm David Michael Nelson and this whole network is saying, no, you're not. No, you're not. I'm telling you, that's a weird feeling to not be who you are. I want to tell you this. There is an identity theft that's going on and it's much more serious than that or your social security or anything of that nature. And here's what it is. We have a spiritual enemy who is lying to us, trying to get us to believe that we are not who God has said we are. And it's a pain, and it's destroying our lives. Here's how he works. Satan works in this way. John 8, says this. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar, and he's the father of lies. And what we need to understand, you guys, is we are being duped Okay, let's try to catch this. We are being duped into believing that our identity and our worth and our value is being derived from other things than God. Now, my guess is, even as I said at first service, I'm thinking, that didn't sound that profound. But let me, let me say this again. We are being duped into believing that our identity, which is where we get our value from, comes from something outside of God. And it will destroy you. I'm telling you right now. In fact, the Bible tells us the thief, our spiritual enemy, seeks to steal and kill and destroy. And one of the things he's trying to do for you who are shaking right now in your boots, he's trying to destroy you. And he's using stuff outside in the world. And I believe God wants to come in here and say, don't do it. Let me tell you who you are. Don't listen to the system out there that's telling you who you are. Let me explain to you a little bit how this happens. One way that we start to believe that our identity or our value is outside of something from God is we base it, don't we, on our performance? See, what we have been trained to do is to believe is if you can get an A, you're better than the person with a B, and if you get a C, and a man, if you flunk, you got no value at all, Right? I mean, if your paycheck, if you're, you know, if you're coming in making minimum wage right now, like, who are you? When somebody else is making six figures and can live in this home, it can have this kind of stuff, it has this prestige, we automatically, we value ourselves based on our performance or our position or the things that we've been able to do, to achieve, to have. I mean, we're Americans, for crying out loud. The land where you're free to be everything that you can be. And I'm telling you, if you be more, then you're more valuable. And that is a lie straight from the pit of hell. It just is. And we bite out. I mean, we just, we just, oh, yeah, I'm all over that. You know, and so we give our whole life trying to get people's approval, trying to get people's admiration. Some of you do it by making yourself beautiful so that people will look at you and guys will drool over you. And and next thing you know, you've got value because people want to be around you. Some of you have personalities where you're able to be the funny guy and you can share the joke and then people think that you're wonderful. And that, We all have our stuff. It's all different. Even in religion, some of you feel like you're more valuable if you do more good stuff. You know? Well, I go every morning, you know, Sunday to K2 the church and I'm in a small group and I tithe and I do and I do and I do. Look at me. I'm really valuable. See, we have to be so careful here, you guys. Because this is not what Jesus Christ is wanting us to understand. Can I share with you why this is such a problem? Because what happens when you lose them? What happens when, and and that's why we need to do this message today. If you have bought the lie that your value is based on your position and you just lost it, who are you? And I'm telling you, people right now, people are... Sadly enough, people are killing themselves today because they've lost a position or financial stability and they feel like they're letting people down. It's just, you know, and and that might be the extreme, but it's happening. And what happens, and let's just, let's not even just take our economy. What happens if you sit there and you say, I'm only really valuable if I'm married? I remember I got married when I was 33, man. I was later, and and I remember people who I loved looked at me and I always felt like a second-class citizen if I'm single. 
can I just say that too is a life in the pit of hell, all you single people? I just want you to know that's just, it's just not true. It's not about your status because you can lose your status. Some of you, you're pouring your whole life into your kids and your identity as I'm a good parent. What happens if your kid grows up and totally rebels against you? Who are you? I, I'm telling you, this is really, really dangerous. In fact, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go one step further with you. And I believe that when we buy this lie, it actually causes us to sin. Now, most of us, you go to church, sinning means you do bad things, right? <laughs> Let me just read for you a couple quotes from Tim Keller. It's a book that we actually sell out here called The Reason for God. He says this, Sin is the despairing refusal to find your deepest identity in your relationship and service to God. Sin is seeking to become oneself and to get an identity apart from him. He goes on, he says this, The primary way to define sin is not just the doing of bad things, but the making of good things into ultimate things. It is seeking to establish a sense of self by making something else more central to your significance, purpose, and happiness than your relationship to God. Could you guys follow that? I should have had that up on the screen. Here's what he's saying. It's not just doing bad things, you guys. It's taking good things. Like being a parent is a good thing. Being married is a good thing. Being a vice president and having money and doing stuff, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But when they become the central thing that you base your significance around, then it's sin. You know what the first commandment is? You know, it's not like don't commit adultery and don't steal. Those are all commandments. You know what the first commandment is? You shall have no other gods but me. And let's, let's, can I just be real? Let's, let's be really honest with each other. For some of you, your God has become the thing that has given you your significance. That's what happens. And that's why when we place anything else at the center to give us our significance, God cringes for us because he knows that it could be gone. Beautiful people get in accidents and they lose their beauty. Athletes who their whole identity is in the ability to perform physically fall on the field and are paralyzed for the rest of their life. You give your life to be successful and you create this business and you get this position and then this economic downturn comes and it wipes it all out. Who are you? Who are you? And see, I think God wants to say to us so much today, please be careful, you guys. Please be careful not to put anything else at the center. Keller says again, he says, only if your identity is built on God and his love can you have self that can venture anything, and I love this, and can face anything. I don't know about you. I'm, I feel guaranteed in this life to lose something. Don't you? Anybody else? Anybody think you're going to get through this life and just, woo, made it. That was awesome. There's not one of you who's ever going to do that. We are all going to go through and have trouble in this life. And I love what he says there. You and I do have the ability to face anything if our identity is based on our relationship with God because he is the only thing that will never change and will never leave you. So here we go. John, Jesus put it this way in John 8, 31. He says, if you hold to my teaching... Then you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you hold to my teachings. See, when I, when I pictured me flying down that hill, I needed something to hold on to to stop me from falling. And I think Jesus is saying, it's me. Hold to me. Hold to my teachings, and you will be free. Free from your anxiety, free from your fear, free from all the stuff, the guilt, the shame that you might be experiencing even this morning. So here's we go. We need to know the truth of who we are and we need to know the truth of how God feels toward us. If you could grab one phrase today, I think it would be this. We need to grab to the love 
of God. And that's why I want to explain to you in, this, in our 15 minutes that we have together. Okay? It starts off right here. 1 John 3.1. The first thing that we need to understand is that our identity, you guys, just hang with me. I feel like it's getting quiet in here, but hang with me. What's happening here is this. Our identity, who I am, is rooted in relationship. Not in performance, not in ability, but it's rooted in relationship. Look at this verse, 1 John 3.1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and I love this, and that is what we are. That's identity right there. You know who I am? Anybody know who I am? Uh, yeah, you're too spiritual. I'm David. No, you're sorry, John. I'm Dave. Yeah, I'm David Michael Nelson. That's who I am. I have three kids. Mariah, Lily, Nelson. Ashlyn, Don, Nelson. Caleb, Eric, Nelson. That's who I am. See, there's, again, there's this genetic thing that has been passed on to me. I have parents, and they had these, this DNA, and they put them two together, and they made me who I am. In fact, you know what? So are you. See, every single one of you sitting out here are the result. Two people got together, and we'll just stop right there. And they made you. And you now exist because of that reason. You have a mom and a dad. That's just the way it goes. That's part of your identity right there. And can I just share this? The fact that you have a mom and dad, for some of you in this room, that has been the very cause for you as an adult to be searching to find out who you are. Because for some of you in this room, you didn't have a mom and dad who lavished love on you. They never told you how valuable you are. And if they did love you, they loved you conditionally. If you perform a certain way, if you look a certain way, if you behave in a certain manner, then I will love you. And I want to tell you this right now. If we grow up without an intrinsic sense that I am just dearly loved, then you will go and you will try to prove that you have value. Because as a human being, you've got to find it somewhere. Every single one of us does. And so for, for the fact that you are a genetic child of a mom and dad, for some of you, that hasn't been that great of a thing. It's actually been the thing that's put you on this pursuit to show the rest of the world that I'm valuable. Now, for some of you, you have a totally different experience. By the way, if you're a parent today, listen really closely to this. Because you and I have a huge job right now with our children. We have a chance to establish in our kids that they are dearly loved. And for some of you, you had that experience. It was completely different. You had someone who lavished love on you, who poured into you, who encouraged you and spurred you on, who accepted you, who invested in you. They gave your life to you. And you just, you went out in this world, but every time you came home, you knew this was a good thing. I, I think about that, man. I got to send my kids out into the world. <sighs> Right? I mean, and what's going to happen? I know my kids are going to get teased. I know my kids are going to get beat up. I know my kids are going to, you know, fail. They're going to not do good in class every once in a while. All of that stuff is going to happen to them, right? And then when they come home, what are they going to get? You rock. They're going to be dearly loved children of mine, period. And see, when you've got that, then when you go out in the rest of the world, looks at you and laughs at you, if the most important people in your life don't, I'm telling you, it makes a huge difference. And for some of you, it wasn't your mom and dad, but you had somebody else who came alongside you, and they were the ones who loved you and accepted you, and it healed you. It's brought healing. Some of you, your spouse has been that for you. It's an unbelievable opportunity that we have to be this for each other. Now, it's so interesting. I was, I, this morning, this is really funny. Just this morning, I, I just wrote down those points. I just written them down. Some of us have had good experiences with our genetics, and some of us had bad experiences. And as soon as I got done with that, I went to my bedroom, and I heard Caleb cry out, and he goes, Mommy, can I come out and watch TV? And Susan responded, Yes, come out, son of my heart. I'm like, who says that? <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm like, yeah, dude, come on out, you know? And Susie goes, I just, I just sat there and I'm like, I walked out and I said, you just gave me my example for today. 
See, because Caleb, is Caleb genetically Susie's son? Yeah. But he is so much more than that. He is the son of her heart. In fact, she told me, I didn't know this. She goes, that's my, she goes, that's my favorite title for him. Because she loves him dearly. Okay, now please, Jesus, help this. What God wants to say to you and me today is 1 John 3, 1. What he wants to say to us is this. How great is the love that I, your father, lavish on you, that I call you my child. See, as a, as a parent, it's so fun every once in a while to put my, kind of understand God from that perspective. I do. Sometimes I think, are you kidding me? Could God really love me as much as I love my own kids? I mean, I don't, see, I struggle still with this identity thing with God. I know he loves me because I read it in the Bible, but I still struggle with it. But then I just think, could he even come close to loving me as much as I love my own kids? And what you guys need to know today is the answer is yes. So if you lose all the other things around you, man, please don't make them the center of your life. Because then they will so let you down. Let my love be the thing that secures you. That word where it says how great, I I love this. That comes from the idea, the expression of being from another country. You know what that means? Because when something's from another country, it's kind of exotic. And it's something that you've never experienced before. How great, how exotic, how un-otherworldly is the love of God for you. And then that he lavishes it on you. He doesn't just sit there and go, yeah, you know, I think you're kind of cool. No, he is pouring it into you, absolutely showering it all over you. And then he says, now listen to me, this is what he says, and that is what you are. You can lose your job. You cannot lose your status as my child. You can have everybody around you think you're a loser, despise you, reject you. That does not change the fact that you are my child and I dearly love you. And even as I say this to you guys, just so you know, I got my stuff. You got yours, don't you? I have my stuff in my life that I still base my identity on. And when it doesn't go well, then I'm like, loser. You know, I just, I beat myself up. I do all that kind of stuff. And I have to go back over and over again and remind myself that he says, I am his and he is mine. And I'm telling you, that is unshakable. Now, one thing I need to help you just real quickly understand is this. I've shared this last year. I'll share it again today. Is some of you, though, as much as God loves you, you have never grabbed hold of his love. It's, it's never been a part of your life. And one of the things you need to understand is there's not a human being on this planet that God doesn't love. Every single person is his creation. You are his idea, and he does love you. But one of the things that's different is, even though you're his creation and he loves you, not everybody is a child of his. To be a child of God is to make a faith decision to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, to receive his forgiveness that has made you stay away from God, and to receive the Holy Spirit into your life. Just look at this. John chapter 1, verse 12 says this. To all who believe him, to those who receive him, to accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God of God. And the reason I wanted to bring that up is because many of you in here today, I might, you might think that God loves you and you're right. It's true. But if you have never received him, if you have not put your faith in him, then you have yet to experience what it is to be born of God and to become a child of his. And once that happens, the Holy Spirit of God will minister to your heart And you will know him like you never knew him before. And he will be your strength, and he will be your security, and he will be your hope when everything else around you is shaking. And I just want to encourage you, man, that 
is what needs to take place. Now, for those of you who are his children, some, you know, we still shake, don't we? I mean, we still struggle, and we still need to know what is really true. And let me just share a, a, a passage of Scripture as we close today that just is, is phenomenal to me. So I'm a dearly loved child of God. Well, what does that mean for me? Look at this. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors for him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all the creation, he just keeps going on and on, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And here's what you need to know today if you're shaken. The love of God towards you cannot be taken away. Let me, let, let's just look at this right now. 835, if you could pop that back up. I'm going to run right through this real quick. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It's almost like Paul is saying, hey, let's have, I'll challenge you right now. You got anything? Anything you want to try to separate me from the love of Christ? I mean, that's what it kind of feels like here. And then he says, he goes through this list. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And you and I have our list. Shall the economic downturn, shall the loss of my job or my position, shall the loss of my social status or people's acceptance or admiration or a relationship that I'm in or the loss of my health, shall any of those things separate me from the love of God? And then what's his answer in verse 37? The answer is no. No. Nothing is going to separate you from my love. And then he says this, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What's that mean, to be more than a conqueror? One guy actually said, you really can't translate this word very well. He goes, my best shot is excessively victorious. <laughs> excessively victorious. That's, it's Tiger Woods, I think. That's what that is. It's just, you're, you're more than anything else. And he says, and he goes, basically, it's the ability to triumph over any adversity. That's what that means. No, in everything that's going to go on in your life, that's going to shake around you, you can be excessively victorious. You can have victory no matter what adversity comes your way. How? Look what he says. How? Through him who loved us. I'm going to love you is what God's saying. He, he, he makes it very clear. Remember, remember, remember Jesus' story? What did Jesus say? The rain comes the, the, the rivers rise, the winds blow, and they beat against every house. Okay, we all got that straight? Don't accept Jesus and go, whoo, good, no more troubles. No, accept Jesus because the troubles and the shaking are going to happen. And then I'm going to love you through it. And I will never leave you. And it's amazing. He goes on and he says, for I am convinced. <laughs> how many of you in here are convinced? Or how many of you go, man, I, I hope so. I think... I mean, i got to be honest with you. When hard stuff comes my way, I have to go through a process. I don't go, oh, trials, these are great. You know, I just don't. I start to doubt. And I think it's the natural thing to do, but I love Paul. He comes in here and says, no, 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 no. I am convinced. Of what? That neither death nor life. Is that still up there? Good. That neither death nor life can separate me. Why? Because if I die, I'm with him. And when I live, I'm with him. I'm good either way. I am convinced that neither angels nor demons, in other words, there's no spiritual force that can separate me from his love. I am convinced that neither the present nor the future, and I think this is a big one for us. See, in other words, that time is not going to change anything. Some of you, your 401k is like gone. And if you're older today and you've lost it, I mean, I'm, I've still got some more years I'm hoping that maybe I'll be able to get some of that back. Some of you are going, this is not fair. And you're thinking your future is not going to be good. For some of you, it's whether you have a job or not, your future, your family hardships. Paul is saying, I am convinced that neither the present right now nor the future can separate me from God's love. I am convinced not that any power, that means any satanic, any evil power, that means any governmental power, that means no power at your work. Your boss who has the power to keep you on or to let you go. There is no power. 
that can separate you from the love of God. And then he goes, neither height nor depth. Another, this is an astronomical term that covers the entire heavens. Paul's just kind of trying to get a point across here. And then he goes, nor anything else in all of creation. Like, just in case I forgot something. Do you understand me, Paul is saying? There is nothing that you're going to go through in this world that can ever stop you from being loved by God. And what's your identity in? The security of the things that can come and go in a second or in the security that the God of the universe who created you loves you and will never let you go. None of that will be able to separate us. And then I'll just close with this. There's a second lie, though, that comes up. And that is, and I kind of already touched on it, but for me, it's when bad things happen, I automatically struggle to believe that God is still good. I mean, when you, if you've lost your job in here today, is, is it, is it, is it, if you're honest, isn't there a little bit of a struggle? Like, doesn't he care about me? Doesn't he care about my family? Doesn't he care about my retirement? I mean, when you lose your health, do you start to question where God is? When all of a sudden the abilities that you had are gone, don't you? I mean, it's, you know what happens? Our spiritual enemy loves to hop in right then and say, I told you he is not good. And he does not love you. And I'm t- So let me just close with this incredibly important verse. Romans 8, 28. It says, we know, we know that in all things, economic downturns, loss of job, struggle with identity. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Verse 31, he says, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? You guys, I can't tell you how critical that verse has been in my life and I know for almost anybody who's followed Jesus. The one thing that we've got to know is even when bad things happen to me, that my Father in heaven says, I want you to know this, I'm with you, I will never leave you, and I will love you, And I will work this thing out for good. He never promises you to take away the troubles. But he promises to be with you in them. And so, as you sit here today, who are you? Who are you? Is your identity being shaken by the things of this world that come and go? Or do you have an unshakable identity? as a child of God who loves you and is with you no matter what you go through. I don't know about you. We're all going to slip and fall. We're all going to be flying down mountainsides. I need something to grab onto. (laughs) And Jesus said, hold to my teaching. Hold to it, and it'll set you free. I believe that every single one of us, if we will make Jesus Christ the center of our life and trust him, that we'll be able to go through whatever happens in these upcoming years and be unshakable. That's what he wants to give us.